Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our second talk, part of the speaker series, Systemic Issues Around Youth and Suicide. Today's talk is titled, Bringing Suicide Out of Darkness. My name is Andrew DeLuca. I'm a junior here at Villanova. I'm a biology major with a double minor in chemistry and sociology. I serve as the Interfraternity Council Vice President for Health Initiatives and the student representative for the Student Life Mental Health and Wellbeing Committee. I wanted to be here today because I lost a good friend, Anthony Mondry, to suicide. Since then, I have been devoted to creating and exposing resources for those who are struggling with mental health, along with helping the community to be more aware of mental health so that we can help those who are struggling. Our guest speaker is Dr. Anthony L. Rostain, who is Chief and Chair, Department of Psychiatry at Cooper University Healthcare. Together with Dr. B, Janet Hibbs, he wrote the book, the stressed years of their lives, helping your kids survive and thrive during their college years. As we'll see, this book is very relevant to today's talk. Dr. Rostein will be in conversation with Dr. Alessandra Seji, who teaches in the Department of Sociology and Criminology here at Bell Youth and suicide is one of her main topics of research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rostein to Bell University. I just want to say it really means a lot to me uh, to be here um, for those of you whose lives have been touched by losing someone they love to suicide, such as your friend. Um, these are really important experiences to share and think about and reflect. And just as a full disclosure, um, even though I've been working in the field of psychiatry for years, um, I lost my son Julian, age 32, on May 19th, 2021. He was a wonderful, wonderful young man who was loved deeply by his friends and his family and tragically did not get help in time. And maybe we'll talk about that later, but I will say that um, this coming Sunday, I'm walking in a, in a walk called Out of the Darkness, sponsored by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. As I've been walking prior to Julian's death, I would go every year with the residents and medical students to lend support to families and friends of those who died this way. And um, suddenly I was there as a, as a family member, which is like the most awful thing to ever have to experience. So I'm not gonna try to put my grief into words. Let me just say it lives in me, it is part of me now, it is part of all of us who love Julian. And, Xander, I really respect how you are honoring your friend's memory, and that I imagine Anthony is a really wonderful person. And so thank you for playing the role you do, um, because it's important. It's important to bring suicide out of the darkness so that we can learn and understand and share and make the world better for those of us who are either struggling to stay alive or those of us that have lost someone this way. Thank you, Dr. Mustaine. Thank you, Xander. Thank you, Father Bernie. Um, and indeed, the shirt I'm wearing that says hope is from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And I have walked the walk. And I will come to your booth, Dr. Mustaine, on Sunday, because it's, it's a tradition for me to, to go to that walk. And yes, interestingly enough, I have lost people to suicide as well. And so before we say anything else, I'd like to point out to the resources since, you know, suicide is not just painful, but it's also complicated, problematic, and can be triggering. So right here today, we have already Father Bernie. Later, um, we have Natalie Edmonds that will join us during the talk, and she's the, the head of counseling services at, uh, here at Villanova, so those are for, to go to people right away. And then the counseling center at large, right? I, I learned when I was in graduate school a, a um, useful slogan, when in doubt, reach out. And so indeed, right, there's no shame, there's no nothing negative about reaching out when, when one needs help. 
which is in a way easier said than done at times, right? But it's important to sort of repeat that it's, it's okay to reach out for help. And before we get started with today, I would also like to announce, as the actual flyer um, points out, that there's going to be a vigil at 6 after this talk. Um, and so it's a candlelight vi vigil, indeed, in remembrance of those that we lost to suicide and in support of those uh, that, are, that may be in need. So, um, Having said all of this, um, I'd like to point out two things, Dr. Rostain, of your biography, of your um, sort of curriculum, so to speak. Um, not only are you a trained psychiatrist, but you have a master's in sociology, which to me, not because uh, it, it sort of uh, is my field, but it speaks to, to your approach, I believe, very much that it speaks to your approach to mental conditions uh, and suicidality in particular. And the other aspect of your profession that I'd like to highlight is the fact that you were co-chair at the University of Pennsylvania, um, um, co-chair of the task force on student psychological health and um, welfare at a very critical, important period for Penn, <coughs> 20, uh, 2014 to 2016, after a spike in suicides on campus. And so the results, right, actually, of that talk, not only are they in, in your book, but right shaped, again, um, sort of the, your, your uh, practice. So I would like to start with the persistent myth around suicide that if we talk about suicide, we're going to cause it. And sort of tie that to the title of our talk that is actually your words um, at that tragic uh, 2021 Out of the Darkness walk where you gave the opening speech you know, after the death of, of your uh, son, and you said it's really, really hard to bring suicide out of the darkness. So, if you could sort of speak to that and, and sort of contextualize then the rest of our talk. Yeah, so I talk a lot with my medical students and residents about something called stigma, and if you all understand that the stigma of having something wrong with you, whatever it may be, feeling depressed, feeling lost, using substances, all of those what we would call anguishing experiences people have, in our culture, we are taught to hide that from others. We're taught to keep it inside. And we're taught that to reveal this is either to be judged as morally weak, or to disclose things that people don't want to hear, or to bring it up, maybe to give people the idea that they suddenly would act on this. And we know from both clinical and lots of research studies, and from many beautiful writings over centuries, that you know human beings contemplate their own death, and many times contemplate bringing on their own death as part of being alive. And yet, because of certain kinds of belief systems, people are afraid. And so what I think of as the darkness that surrounds suicide is based in fear, it's based in loneliness and isolation, and it's based in being convinced that no one around them can help them. And I want to puncture those myths by telling you all that we can do better, and that's why we belong to this organization, is to both educate and to bring out of darkness these ideas about suicide so that it isn't seen as something shameful or something that we have to hide. That's really the fundamental view. Now we can go into other aspects of suicide, Obviously, I as a physician, as a psychiatrist, as a clinician, 
oftentimes consider this in my work. How risky is this person to who is expressing suicidal thinking to go ahead and do something about it? But I will say that I, as a physician, now any of us in the clinical world, have to acknowledge that the cause of suicide are go well beyond mental disorders or mental illness. They are rooted in aspects of the social life that people feel. And um, you know, we can talk about this some more later because um, the, the concept of what, does, what causes suicide has to be expanded beyond it's an individual's pathology. Okay? I want you to leave with that idea that when you study suicide over broad populations, as Durkheim, Emil Durkheim, the father of modern sociology did, he was able to identify, yes, suicide from shame, loneliness, depression is one type, but there are other forms of suicide, altruistic suicide, where one is giving one's life in order to save others. Fatalistic suicide, where one is facing death anyway and thinking about, well, I might as well just do it now because it's going to end for me anyway. And then anomic, anomi was the phrase that Durkheim talked about. Anomi means feeling like you don't belong in society, that you are totally ex external to anything that's going on. You're out there in no, and have no role that's socially acceptable or that's personally acceptable. And those are very powerful concepts to think about the people you know who may be feeling marginalized, excluded, or feel like failure. And I'll add one more idea to, the, to this stream of thought, which is that when we did really a deep dive into college students and their thinking about their own deaths, feeling suicidal, a lot of it had to do with fear of not making it in school and being forced to leave the university. So we were faced with a terrible dilemma because here's someone who needs care, needs to take time off, and yet they're afraid to disclose how seriously afflicted they are with thoughts of dying because they're afraid they're going to be sent away from the community. The truth is that being in a community and feeling a part of that community is actually helps prevent or lower the rate of suicide. And we know that because if we compare the rates of of, of suicide, completed suicide among college students and you compare it to same age individuals who are not in college, the rate is about a half. So you're twice as likely to die from suicide if you're not part of a community at being in the age group of people that come. So those are some facts I just wanted to share. Thank you, yeah. And there are <coughs> sort of related thoughts that I'd like to add. That um, versus one, the idea that in fact a related myth to the first myth we just mentioned about suicide is also that again suicide is always related to mental illness and not at all. Um, and the, your reference to you know people in college, right? You call it in your book um, the stressed years of their lives, um, which we uh, right you co-wrote. Yep, yep the idea of this destructive perfectionism, right? The belief that one has to be perfect in every academic, curricular, and social endeavor. And that's socially constructed, right? It's not something that we're born with. And so um, th there's actually a, a, a new book um, that we didn't discuss, but perhaps you're familiar with, um, under Pressure by Seth Abutin and uh, Anna Mueller that precisely focuses, it's an ethnography, right, of, of uh, a wealthy community undisclosed to the public, but they spent years in that community studying an, this affluent community, and the, the sort of the net result, the gist of it, was that indeed the extreme pressure that these young people felt on themselves seem to have been, you know, the main drive towards suicidality. And so, um, and again in your book, 
uh, you focus then on the idea uh, of family values, economic pressure, and cultural expectations that um, uh, we, we grew up in or we breathe day in to day out that then can shape our, uh, then again, sort of outlook on life. So uh, perhaps before we, we, we talk about more the, the so the components or the ways, you know, the alienation, marginalization, limited opportunities that some individuals have. Can we talk a little more about the complexity or literally the complexities of suicide? Okay, so it still matters that this person is serious about ending their life. Why might that be? And then what do we make of it if the act is completed? And I'm still asking myself the same sorts of questions about Julian. Like what happened? And what, what, what did we miss? And um, if we want to, I think there's a wonderful article, if any of you are interested, um, by a British psychiatrist called Eight Truths About Suicide, which came out last year. And she pretty much discloses that from the time she started her training, 20 years earlier, one of her first patients died by suicide. And subsequently, she's become sort of inadvertently an expert in this because many of her patients either were suicidal or had died by suicide. And um, the first, so there's eight truths. The first is that suicide is not an accident, that there are some precursors to it, that there is some logic or some thinking process and actually, in some ways, it is an expression of the ultimate effort of an individual to get mastery over a situation that is, for them, impossible to face or to continue while alive. So that's the first truth. It's not an accident. The second is that we never really know why someone dies by suicide. We can, you can wonder, what was the final straw that broke the camel's back. What were they thinking about at that moment? But only about one out of four people who die by suicide leave a note. And even the notes don't explain exactly how the dots were connected. Often there are themes of intolerable pain, feeling of failure, feeling of loss that they cannot tolerate. But it's really hard because those of us that are alive still feel like there's a reason to live. How is it this person lost that reason? And it's, it's, haunting, it's haunting us to try to figure it out, but it's actually, for me anyway, in my own personal experience, and I have counseled other families who've lost their children to suicide, this understanding that there's something we can't understand so that the why may never be known. Okay? The why just may never be known, and that's a humbling fact. Okay? The next is that um, the act of suicide itself is an acting out of some form of belief in this is what I have to do. There is many, many different explanations behind that statement, but essentially, it's as if the self cannot any longer, cannot any longer live with oneself. It's become impossible to live. Now, well, let me go on because, so what happened to you, what happened to me, what happens to most people who lose someone to suicide is that you feel shocked. And this happens on the college campus, it happened when the director of the counseling program at, at the University of Pennsylvania died by suicide. We were just talking about that before when I came in. Um, it just blew everybody's mind. How could that be? Um, and it kind of reminds me of a song that Simon and Garfunkel once sang about Richard Corey, which is based on a very well-known poem. Do uh, you know the poem, Richard Corey, or the song? So Richard Corey was this handsome, rich, successful young man. And yet, at the end of the song, he puts a bullet through his head. And it's like, how could that be? You know, I wish I understood. 
because all along in the song, the singer says, I wish I could be that guy. I wish I could be rich and poor. He has everything. And at the end, of course, the shock is that this person who has everything, lots to look forward to, lots of resources, ends up dying by suicide. So I remember that song when I was in high school. And actually, when I was in high school, there was someone in our high school who died by suicide. And it took us months before we could really even get it, get our heads around it. You know, we went to his funeral, etc. But could not believe it for months. So, OK. Second, the next is that suicide can be either premeditated or impulsive or both. So some people spend a lot of time thinking about it. Other people, it's a snap decision. Oftentimes, by the way, if they're under the influence of substances, um, that could actually facilitate the act. And then occasionally, it's semi, one of a little bit of each. So again, lots we don't know. Sixth is that, and I said this earlier, and uh, we are both believers in this concept that suicide is part of the human condition. Humans can contemplate their lives, the end of their lives, and they can contemplate ending their lives. And it's not a strange thought. Now, some people think of, you know, never me, never, ever, ever. But the fact is that throughout history, um, you know, people have written about this. And um, the, uh, this article in particular quotes Albert Camus. And Camus was a brilliant French existentialist philosopher and a novelist. And he, he wrote a book called The Myth of Sisyphus. And in The Myth of Sisyphus, you know this, you all know the myth of Sisyphus? Do you know the story? Okay, so Sisyphus is condemned for upsetting the gods. It's a Greek myth. And his punishment is that every day he has to roll a boulder up this mountain. And he spends the entire day pushing the boulder up this mountain to the very top. And he gets to the top and he feels great only to have the boulder fall down to the bottom, and the next day he has to start over. So Camus uses this image to sort of talk about what keeps us going. Why do we keep going to push the boulder to the top? And one of these explanations is because the joy you get by getting there keeps you going. But then what you have to do is face the disappointment that come the next day, you've got to push that boulder right back up the mountain. And so he poses this question that whether or not to kill yourself is actually a fundamental issue from an existentialist perspective. And I actually loved reading that book. I don't know if you did, but it, it, it speaks to me about the vastness of this question and how, again, we need a broader lens than just, oh, that's a person with mental illness. Okay. But by the way, within the context of Villanova, and your tradition, um, Jesuit tradition, I think this issue of faith and loss of faith is very relevant to this. I mean, I'll let, I'll let those of you that are more versed in that tradition speak to that question. But the crises of faith often lead people to contemplate dying. It's like, God has failed me, or I am not ever going to find what I can in life. Uh, OK. Obvious point, we can't read other people's minds. So that's why you need to ask them, hey, you look down, are you OK? Do you want to talk? By the way, asking people if they're OK isn't the best way to ask if they're OK. Best question is to say, can you tell me what's going on with you? It's a more open-ended question. You look down, you want to tell me what's up? As opposed to, are you OK, which makes it easy to say, yeah, I'm fine, because those don't want to talk about it. That's just a little technique. You probably want to think about how you ask the questions of the people that you're worried about. And most of all, it's please tell me what you're feeling. Please let me know. You can trust me. I want to hear what's on your mind. And finally, this one is huge because the people who survive suicide often have survived the loss of someone who died by suicide often feel that they did something wrong. 
And that's actually what um, I said at this walk on suicide, was that when you say suicide can be prevented, it sort of implies that if it happened, you didn't do something. And I have a much more humble view of that, right? And, and the people who are suffering from the loss of someone they cared about should not be made to feel worse than they already do. So that's why I, I, I like to say things like, on a broader societal level, we might be able to make things easier, like dealing with perfectionism. But the people around the person who died need help with dealing with their sense of guilt. That is, and I don't know if you felt that, but everyone who not, loves someone who dies always asks themselves that question. What did I miss? What could I have done to stop this from happening? And not to mention that sometimes the few times in which we're able to hear from the people that try to kill themselves, they say, well, I had a change of mind. But when it does happen, we don't know. And there's a, there was a kid who's now a, an accomplished speaker and advocate for suicide prevention by the name of Kevin Hines, yes. your mother. And he wanted to end his life. And um, he said the moment he let go on the bridge he was on, he said, what have I done? And he fell, this was in San Francisco by the Golden Gate Bridge, he fell and survived. And that's why we know that uh, and he's one of the few people that have survived that jump, by the way. And, but it, he's here and has spent the rest of his life, he's worked in this field for about 20 years when this happened. He has lived literally to say that yes, he wanted to do it, but then he didn't want to do it. And once he went off that bridge, it was literally a sea lion that contributed to save him and that pushed him up. And he felt, he's very funny, he's, <laughs> oddly enough, he, he is plunging into the water and he says, he felt something brushing my leg and he says, oh great, I survived the jump and now there's something is eating me in the water. It was a sea lion trying to push him up to the surface. But how many people have we lost that haven't been able to tell us if, if they really meant it? And so the work that we do here and our presence here to say, well, maybe it's not always preventable, but we're here to do our best without hopefully any guilt, that doesn't mean that we don't feel horrible, right, when we lose people. But so, and he's part of it, he was featured in a documentary uh, called The Bridge, yeah, by Eric Steele, um, about which I've actually written something about. A uh, very problematic documentary, which we don't need to get into, <laughs> but, but so, Understanding, I don't know if we want to discuss now that we're sort of given a sense of right the complexity of suicide. Um, if you if you want to talk a little more about the, the sort of again the social dynamics, alienation, marginalization, oh, and the limited opportunities that people that are marginalized or alienated have, or if we want to jump into more like the proactive approach that we can do at the college level, at the family level, at the individual level. So I sort of give you the choice to... Well, so is there more that you... I guess maybe just let me show a couple... I think from the standpoint of what do you do on a societal and level and at the level... We can talk later about what do you do with people you know on the personal level, but let's think about how we conceptualize this. And this is right now, and this is sort of the current model we have for both risks and, and um, supports that go into the notion here that it's an individual embedded in a social system. I'm not going to go through every single 
box up there, but it allows you to see that from the society standpoint, we are trying our best to do things like increase the protective factors and reduce the risk factors, okay? And whether that's got to do with improving relationships, like what you can do here is improve the network of community that you have, which is extremely protective. People will endure incredible pain if they feel that their pain means something, and if their life means something, not just to themselves, but to the people around them. I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to who've said, you know, I would kill myself but for my dog, my friend, my kids, my parents, okay, my buddies. So think about that, that it's you embedded in a community, and then we look beyond that to things like means restriction and all the rest. Yes, yes, yes. We, so here's another one to look at the risk factors, okay? Now this is more around, if I were to speak to somebody about them, their thoughts about suicide, what would be some of the important things? Well, one is the clinical. What do I assess? How bad is their suffering? I'm not saying their depression because as you heard earlier, depression may not be what fuels people to die. It may be psychosis, it may be substances, it may be rejection, it may be failure. And that's where destructive perfectionism comes in. If I fail, I am nothing. Then we look at the family. I mean, the, the, the other components to this include the family. And this is another way of representing, I would say, that you know, we are all part of a bigger culture. So you think about, and as a, from a sociologist's perspective, what's the messaging that's going on right now, not just in a lecture like this, but on TikTok and on YouTube and on all of the media that you consume day in and day out? Does the messaging give you a sense of hope? Or is it giving you a sense of futility and of dread? and of purposelessness. Because I would argue that what we talk to our patients about more than anything else is do you have a purpose for being alive? Do you feel you have a purpose? And people who don't have a purpose, whether they're depressed, whether they're anxious, whether they're, that person needs help with figuring out their purpose. So that's, what are the things I do? And then in terms of like some of the more, I would say, I'm not gonna go through all of this now, I just say that these are part of my reference points, is that if you think about a crisis that you're having in life that might lead you to think you can't go on anymore, what it really matters to me is thinking about your coping reserve. What do you have in your tank that helps you to keep pushing that boulder up the hill? What allows you to endure disappointment? What allows you to endure rejection? What allows you to endure plain old loneliness? Okay? And those are what we call the coping resources or the resilience factors. There are some deeper factors that have to do with our biology and our personality. That's much harder to change. So there are people who constitutionally are more prone to becoming suicidal and or to, to, to actually carry out an act because of those other variables. But what can we change? We can keep making sure that that resilience in you or the person you're caring about is filled up as far as you can. Because if you run out of the you know, reserves, and you can see on the left, stress and, and loss and conflict and, you know, just, so I would say to the students, you know, around the time of exams, you want to make sure you're sleeping enough, maybe you've got pets to pet around here. I'm not being trivial about that. Anything that reduces stress improves your chances of being able to handle distress, okay? Okay, so I think we can just go into, uh, we, we don't need to go through the rest of the slides, I don't think, because I really want to, uh, oh, well, you want to advance, I'll tell you what. Uh, let me advance and say, simply say, from the clinician's side, this is what I teach 
medical students about this. We distinguish between yeah, we distinguish between self harm and acts to end one's life, and they're not the same. But most of all, you can see from the standpoint of the of the that these are the warning signs. I would urge you all who are interested in working on this to become familiar with the warning signs because there are verbal and there are nonverbal or behavioral, and then there's the psychological dimension. So for example, interestingly, panic and anxiety are actually greater risks for taking acts to end one's life than just being blah, okay? Blah doesn't do it as often as I'm panicking. I can't take this anymore. And we have an example of someone in the book who had just gotten a really bad grade in English and was literally in the library peering down thinking about throwing themselves off the balcony. And they had a thought, maybe I shouldn't. But what was pushing them at that moment was extreme panic. So those are, I mean, I, could, I, I, could, I don't want to read the whole list, you know, but think about the fact that if you see this in people you know, it's important to say to them, hey, there's something that's going on here that I would like to be able to learn more about. Questions? Can we ask a question? Sure. Any questions right now? We'd like to introduce. I just have a question about the both of you. Um, where does your guys' like insurance for psychology and like psychiatric psychiatry come from? Because like sure. from so when we're we kids or repeat the question, where is the our interest in psychiatry or psychology come from? Where does that come from? Yes. Well, okay, for first of all, I grew up in New York City and I was a, it's a really I'm a social person. I like people. I like figuring out what makes people tick. And my mom was like that. So she'd have people all the time. We'd be talking about feelings. You know? And um, I read a lot and thought a lot about, and I majored in psychology in college. I actually majored in psychology and philosophy. Because I actually am very interested in what, what, what's the roots of consciousness and where is where does who we think of ourselves? Where does all that come from? Um, I became a teacher. And I, did, I taught high school biology, but I also taught high school psychology. And I invented a course at the time called Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll because my students were interested in all three. Um, that was before the days of hip hop, but you know, it would be hip hop if I were teaching it more recently. And I was really struck by how much adolescents are questioning who they are, what they're supposed to do with their lives. So I became really drawn to that age in life we call adolescence. And then I went to medical school, decided to be a pediatrician, came to Children's Hospital, and I was all set to just do general pediatrics and work with teens in the medical setting. But I got so impressed with the needs of teenagers who were not getting the help they needed with depression, anxiety, um, ADD, learning disabilities, so I started to, I decided to become a psychiatrist. And when you become a psychiatrist, basically you spend all day long finding out what's on people's minds, which I happen to really like. So even when they're not happy, I'm trying to help them figure out, well, what, what can you do to deal with your life's problems? Um, the last thing I'll say is, as someone who likes biology and psychology and sociology, the model of the mind that we use in my field is called the biopsychosocial model. So if you were to come and talk to me, I'd want to know about your moods and your, your rhythms and your biological state, you know? I'd want to know about how you think about yourself and the people around you. And I'd want to understand more about your social environment. Now we've expanded the model, very relevant nowadays, to a spiritual dimension. And now we think of it also from an ecological. How do you see yourself? on the planet Earth, because the planet Earth is having trouble. So that's threatening people's sense of being OK, right, when we talk about that. And so to answer, I hope that answers your question. Yes. Curiosity and 
and, and, and feeling really like, hey, I, I'm pretty good at this. Was it for me too? Yes. Oh, yeah. So, well, I got to sociology because I said to myself, well, I, I'm gregarious, I like people, so it's almost a no-brainer. I, I, I like to be with people. I was six when I decided I wanted to be a teacher because I said I can work with people, I like the interaction. It really almost makes me cry. I used to teach in high school, uh, in high school, in, um, in grad school, I used to teach foreign language for languages, Italian included, and it was so, it brought me to tears to see the development. This kid that knew nothing coming in except for pizza and mozzarella in Italian because they are common words. And then by the end of the course, they, they would greet me, they would tell me their day, about their day in Italian. And it was a very enriching experience for, for me. And so uh, then sort of going backwards, Psychology is definitely the foundation of my being center. Uh, I, I hope I do exude some semblance of centeredness, but definitely, and because of the suicides, frankly, that, that I experienced in my life, therapy was really the, uh, has been the bedrock. The, the condos in New York City that I did not buy because of the money that I invested in therapy, that's awesome. <laughs> I would do it all over again. But so, and so we, similarly to Dr. Rostein, a, a curiosity about people, about how they work, how the mind work, and how people work together, so to speak, in society. And so, and then, yes. So the other thing that's important about what you're hearing is that to help other people, you have to really like people. If you don't like people, it's not worth going into the field. Secondly, it's collaborative relationship, like you mentioned the word therapy. You know, therapy means different things to different people. There are lots of models of therapy, just like there are lots of models of the mind. But the essential point about therapy is that the person coming for help needs to engage in a process of learning, like as if they're learning a language. Some of them need to learn, some people need to learn the language of the, of the, of the heart. What am I feeling? How do I deal with those feelings? Where do those feelings come from? What are those feelings doing to me? How much of those feelings are based in thoughts that are actually distorted thoughts? So we have all kinds of approaches, but the most important thing is you, the, you as a therapist have to create a relationship. So that's number one. It's all about relationship. And secondly, through that relationship, help the person address what's most important to them without me judging as much as possible. Now, of course, if they're going to do something like kill themselves, then I might say to them, like, I, I'm sorry, but you know, I'm going to need to intervene here so that at least we can have another conversation. Because if you kill yourself, our relationship ends. And I don't want it to end that way. But aside from those extreme examples, most of the time what we do is we listen to how people are struggling and whether or not, they, how, how do they evaluate what they're doing to deal with those problems? And what do they need to do to shift out of a sense of either hopelessness, helplessness, frustration, you know, confusion? Um, perfectionism is a great example. I mean, perfectionism is a trap that people get themselves into. And it's important to unpack it. Like, where did you think that you had to be perfect in order to be lovable. So when we talk about destructive perfectionism, which is one of the most important things that I learned talking to college students, and you're at a very competitive school, just like Penn, very, very competitive school. So to get here, you have to work really, really hard. And you have to really drive yourself beyond where most people do to achieve. But what happens with that is you begin to identify who you are with what you do and what you achieve. And it's that overvaluing of achievement and the underappreciation of just, hey, you know, you're just alive, that's good. Just being who you are is okay. No, destructive perfectionists cannot tolerate the fact that they're human, that they have faults, 
that they're not always right, not always getting A's. In. So that's one area that I've spent a lot of time working on, is, is this concept of how do I help someone who has a distorted idea of what it means to be a, a success? Because the way they define success is all external, rather than what's inside. Yes, Father. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, the topic, I'd like to hear a little bit more on it, as you say, about perfectionism versus destructive perfectionism. Because uh, I presume it's coming from the family, it's coming from society, it's coming from the school, it's coming from business, right? That you need to have all these things in order to make it. Correct. You, you can make it there, right? So you have to... But where does it, how does it, or where does it turn to destructive? And can, is there is there any uh, thing you can say more about that? Because, you know, being perfect, you know, is, so, is, is a challenge, but being destructive is no good. So, okay, so first of all, there is a constructive way to be perfectionistic, or what I would call a benign perfectionism, which says, I can do better. Like, I got, a, I got a, an 80 on my test, um, what do I need to do to get a better grade next time? And you say to yourself, okay, I have to study this. I maybe meet with the teacher. I have to do a little more homework. You take the quote less, you know, you, do, you didn't do as well as you wanted to. You take that as a motivator to want to do better. When people have destructive perfectionism, they tend to become the opposite. And there are lots of psychological studies to distinguish between the two. What they then tend to do is they get angry at themselves, they get fearful, and they avoid. And they avoid doing what they need to do to improve. Because then they begin to project, I'm going to screw up again. So destructive perfectionism has a vicious cycle to it. Um, how it evolves, I would say that it's partly family, it's partly personality, it's partly society, but most of all, it's the belief that if you're not 100% perfect, you're a failure. So it's what we might call black and white thinking. Whereas healthy perfectionism, which is the striving to be as good as you can, allows you to be, make a mistake and you go, okay, I can learn. So I like the learning paradigm. When a, when a person is so rigid that if they're not perfect, they fail, there's not much room then for learning because we only learn through failure, right? That's the big secret. It's like there's no such thing as one trial learning. Psychologists have proved that. You give somebody something to do, the first time they're going to screw it up, and then they get a little better, and then they get a little better. That's what learning is. So I don't know if that helps explain Thank you. And yet, right, when, to your point about we learn from failure, again, somebody at Penn, Adam Grant, yes. has been studying, right, the idea that the CV shows your accomplishments, the things you, you know, reached, but how about the CV with all the times you messed up that got you to the four or two page CV? For the business people, right, it's, it's a two page thing, but in academia, it's never ending. But what about all the failures, right, that yet are at the bedrock of the uh, never-ending CV with all the talks and whatnot? And so the culture, again, then points to, ah, you need to succeed, you need to excel, here's the internship I got, here's the, the super grades I got, here's the super advanced placement course I took, etc., etc back to the pressure issue again that society puts on, on students, young people in general. And then, to your point, Dr. Rostain, the idea that the, the um, destructive perfectionism, again, in the social psychology or slash um, sociology field, is it's literally called uh, the self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Yeah. So you're not doing well, you fail, but you want it to be perfect, so then you're going to stew, stew in your stew, and you're indeed not going to be perfect, and, and it's, it's, it is indeed a trap. So I have a funny story about who's perfectionistic or not, right? We, so I was, uh, 
when at Penn we had a clinic for especially focused on college students with attention problems. And we would evaluate them and see if we could help them. And I'll never forget this young guy from, from Villanova who came in and um, he was a B student. His parents wanted him evaluated for ADHD. They were convinced he could be an A student. Parents were very perfectionist. They wanted him to be like them. They were highly achieving people, really achieving people. So we finally interviewed this guy. He's a sophomore, the house school. I love it. What do you love about it? Well, classes are good. I have friends. I play, I play sports. And you know, enjoy the fraternity that I'm in. I said, well, are you having a problem with concentrating? No. So well, how come you're getting B's? He goes, I don't want to get A's. I'm happy with B's. I go, you sure? He goes, yeah. I actually, I know I could get A's. But I'd have to work real hard. I'd have to give up my friends and my sports and my fraternity to crack the books to get an A. It's not worth it. So we brought the parents in and said, guess what? Your son does not have ADHD. And he's just not a perfectionist. He's not a type A like you. He's a type B. He's more relaxed. And it was a really interesting reaction to see the parents go, you're kidding. If he could get A's, why doesn't he want to get A's? And I said, because he wants to enjoy his life. And that was the end of this consultation. So that was sort of the, who has the perfectionism? It was them, not him. He was able to say, not me. I don't want that life. So I found that to be quite instructive. Other thoughts? I know we're, we're going far afield, but what, what I guess I'm asking all of you, because my thought is that how do you address it on this campus? You know, What would be some of the things that are concerning you? I'll give you one fact that we quote in the book as well, is that at any given time, this is what worries me, at any given time, there are students in Villanova who admit they are not only depressed, but thinking of killing themselves. And only about, at most, a third of them will be getting help. More like a quarter. In these national samples of epidemiologic samples of college students with strong sociologic methodology, when they looked at the people who on the surveys were scored in the high depressed slash suicidal range, they analyzed those students and found that 25% were getting help, the other three quarters were not. When asked why were you not getting help, what do you think their answer was? I'm not, this isn't a test. What do you think they said? Yeah. They didn't see the point? I don't see the point. That's one answer. Another one, yeah. I don't have time. I don't have time. That was actually the second most common answer. The first most common answer was similar to what you said. It's no big deal. I'll be fine. Not a big deal. Then the fourth one was, I can take care of this myself. So it's not a big deal. I can't see the point. I don't have time. It's going to get better on its own. And these are students who are reporting, thinking about ending their lives. So to me, what that says is that we have to make a better case to people who are thinking that way that, well, maybe it is worthwhile. Maybe it isn't that you don't have enough time. Maybe you need to rethink your avoidance of getting help. But why do you think it is that people you might know, people you might be concerned about, what stops them? Because you do have a counseling program here. It's not like they can't go and get help. So what can we do to message differently? How do we help people feel more like help is there? That's the questions I pose to everyone wherever I go, because I don't have, there's no one answer for that one. 
Is there something in the culture at Villanova that is different from what I described? Or do you, do you think there are people like that here who are depressed or feeling really lonely and aren't getting help? Or is Villanova fine? Nobody has a problem. I can't believe that, right? So how do we, how do we help those people? Or do we just have to wait for them to help themselves? I think Sander put the finger on one of the social issues. I hope you don't mind. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but right there, we just discussed how suicide is complex. But one aspect, if we look along gender line or actually sex lines as in difference between male and female, what goes by the overused yet appropriate name of toxic masculinity comes into play, right? Statistics about males that kill themselves are higher than, than women, mostly because of the means of suicide that they use that are more fatal. We're not going to get into the specifics, perhaps, unless you guys ask. But and 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 behind that also there is a culture that preponderantly teaches that as a movie heart-wrenching, boys don't cry, basically said loud and clear that if you're a guy, you're not supposed to show emotions. And how can you go to therapy, right? How can you go to counseling if you're not supposed to show emotion? How can you build a relationship with your therapist if you're not going to express yourself? So I think that is part of the problem. And so when to your club, right, men's uh, mental health club, right, is right there, right? Being male, being a man doesn't mean that you cannot, right, uh, right, feel pain and or seek help in terms of mental health when in need, right? The, the opposite is actually true, right? But not asking help, actually, again, we we go deeper. I remember I studied in, in, in New York City in grad school, and I lived at um, International House uh, up on the Upper East uh, West Side. And one wonderful speaker that came to talk was a person that was blind. And he revealed that for years, he would not ask for help when going places, going to, he was a public speaker, because he felt he couldn't say that he needed help because he couldn't see. But he finally understood that not asking for help, right, was, was shooting himself in the foot with, a, with an unfortunate metaphor here, right? Because, he, like for instance, he talked about how as a kid he was trying to play chess with a friend, but he couldn't see the board. And so he lost. And so he says, oh, I'm not good. That's why I lost. And they were just like, wait a minute. What do you mean I'm not good? I couldn't even see what I was doing. So get the tools, the, right, the help you need to then do what you want to do. And so mental health counseling, in whichever spiritual counseling, whatever, whichever forms it might take for you, right? Asking for help is, is important, and it's the start, right? Again, it's, it's not easy, necessarily, but by the end, it can be very, very healing and important and empowering. So you want, you want to go ahead? Do you have other questions? Because I was thinking, move ahead to um, the, some of the other yeah. yeah. Um, so, first of all, I just want to make a plea for the fact that families are part of this. And part of the reason we wrote the book we did, the books we have, is that a lot of times families are villainized by schools or made, made, even by therapists. It's, oh, it's all the family's fault. And, and we really don't believe that. We, we believe that even if a family has contributed to the problem, they can also be part of the solution. Um, and so one of the things that we, we try to recommend is that whoever's working with a troubled person, whatever it is, and it may not even be around the issue of suicide, it really is important that that family members be included, even if it's nothing more than to get 
a further understanding of where this problem originated and how it, 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 it in some way, inadvertently perhaps, that the pressure of the family may be making, playing a role. You know, that book, Pressure, speaks to this idea. And what we've noticed is that given the higher cost of college education, that means that there's a higher cost of failure and a fear that college student feels that they're making an incredible burden on their parents for not achieving what they want. So we're big on getting everybody in. And then as far as the models out there, the resources, um, and we, we mentioned this in the book, but the Jed Foundation was started by the parents of a young man named Jed who died by suicide in college. And if any of you after today want to learn more about, this is the best, single best resource to help inform. It's not just college students. Now it's also including, um, it's aiming at high school students. Okay, but they have a whole, what you could call a public health approach. And number one up there you can see is promote social connectedness. Identify students at risk, increase help seeking behavior, provide substance and you know, substance abuse and mental health, follow crisis management, restrict access, and develop life skills. That is, at this point, in my view, the state of the art of how a campus, and I don't know if Villanova has become part of the compact yet of JED, but JED will come and help a school like they did while we were doing this task force at Penn. We called up Jed, Victor, Dr. Victor Schwartz, uh, and he was at the time at Jed Foundation. And they came to visit us and they said, here's what you need to do. And make sure you, you do all these things. Messaging that help is there, building social connection, improving access to care, et cetera, et cetera, and building skills. So I'm a big believer in, uh, in, in the skills side. So here they have the resources, they keep it up to date. This has got all of the best practices you can think of, sort of how to, how to prevent as best that we can. Um, there's also a guide that for campuses, whenever there is a big, a big loss. Um, then I mentioned beyond Jed Foundation, there's the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, there's Active Minds. Does, does Villanova have an Active Minds? Um, okay, so the Active Minds, I'll tell you about Active Minds. It's got chapters all across the country. And what you're doing is actually what Active Minds tries to foster is students talking to one another about issues. Um, it was a foundation that was started by one of my former students at Penn, she decided instead of going to graduate school that she was going to start this foundation because her brother had died by suicide when he was a sophomore at Columbia. And she, she was devastated, but she gave her, was given her life to this. So Active Minds has chapters all throughout the country and they bring speakers in. So you're sort of unofficially doing the work of Active Minds. And then there's NAMI, which is the National Alliance of Mental Illness. Um, there's a website that has in it what I would call inspirational video about how you can stop from going too far. This is a beautiful, yes, it's, yes, it's, no, yes. And we can't play it right no, now. I, I, I had, uh, you have it? I did, but then when I shut it down, it disappeared, but I'm going to find it. So, so Now Matters Now is a remarkable website because it really is, is a resource for people who are going through crisis. Um, and then the last thing I was going to say is that we can't, we can't really answer any individual's life crises, but we can bear witness to their suffering. And I'm a big believer in this. One of my teachers in medical school said to me that Americans think that we can solve everything. But some things you don't solve. You just have to live through. You have to try to accept. And so he gave me this notion of, um, of accompaniment 
And what we can do is accompany each other through the darkness, which is what I think also the tr religious traditions that you practice here offer as well. So if you want to go through the video, I hope it'll play. Yes. Do what you have to do. Uh, to make it worth it. And if the rug doesn't do it, paint the walls. If that doesn't do it, you know, get a, get a cat. Better yet, get a cat with a lot of problems. And then, you know, there's your focus. Everyone is different. We all have different experiences and different strengths. You are the best judge of what will help you. Real people who have found these skills helpful want you to know that the most important thing is to try something at least a little, so that you can really know if it might help you. And so it could be that people um, who are on the more sensitive end of things and who are more sensitive to other people's feedback, that that, um, that, that end of the biology, um, that they just need extra special strategies for managing what they're experiencing. Asking for help is something I am still learning Sometimes a little extra help can be just what someone needs to get through tough times. Now Matters Now was designed to give people that help when they need it. The online video-based program includes real people who teach specific coping skills like mindfulness, paced breathing, and opposite action. It's temporary and it's not going to last forever, those thoughts. They'll, they'll move on, and you can too. But what if there's nothing to figure out? What if you're just depressed? Then what do you do? You do exactly the opposite. You have to activate yourself. Get yourself doing things. That's the opposite of staying in bed all day or being passive and doing nothing. Do something crazy. Do something you've never done. Go roller skating. I know it may not be the thing you want to do. Go buy a freaking plane ticket somewhere and, and <laughs> just shock yourself. There are so many different perspectives. And when you're in such a dark place, your, your lens is so dark that it's cutting out all of the, the bright things and the things that, that people live for. So, if the message is, if you go on the website, or you have a friend you're worried about, tell them to go to the website, because it's got lots of different instructions on all of these techniques. Getting activated, doing mindfulness, doing um, anything that makes you feel better. This is my, one of my favorite poems by Mary Oliver. She says, instructions for living life, pay attention, be astonished and talk, tell about it. I don't know if you know Mary Oliver. She's an amazing poet. Poetry helps me in my darkest times. And Mary Oliver's the other one that I love. She's one of the most important ones. And finally, those of you that remember Peanuts, Charlie Brown says, what is happiness? Happiness is a warm puppy, says Lucy. So it comes in many flavors and forms, but you know, expanding your consciousness a little bit to incorporate those ideas might make it easier for you or the people you care about. I don't know if there's some closing thoughts you have. Uh, yes, I wanted to go back to your the tank example, sort of the metaphor, right? The coping mechanisms that one has, and the idea that, um, and it sort of came through in the video too, and I don't know if they worked with him, but the work of Edwin Schneidman is, resonates with me in the sense that in this context, Edwin Sch Schneidman um, was a pioneer in the multidisciplinary study of suicide, and his point is that the suicidality or suicidal intent or ideation or then you know uh, actually doing it comes out of 
an imbalance between one's coping skills and the challenges that one has in front of oneself. And so increasing the, the positive input, you know, filling up the tank is very important. And it starts way early and every single day of our lives, so to speak, sort of like the distribution of suicide prevention, not as such, but suicide prevention as creating lives that people want to live, creating an environment where, again, the pressure is not through the roof so that you do want to quit. And so it's sort of a much more if you want localized or sort of a, a, a broader life affirming um, type of suicide prevention that again, like I said, starts way before those specific warning signs that we saw. And so in the video, right, when, when the woman was saying, well, the, the thought is temporary, right? The thought of being trapped or being too anxious, et cetera. But when the person feels that, right, the, what then triggers the impulse to kill oneself is that they are drowning. They are not able to breathe metaphorically, right? Not necessarily literally sometimes, also literally. And so if we think, and that's what Edwin Schneidman would say, if we think that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem, then you know that whatever we're facing is indeed somewhat do, do, um, um, resolvable, that we can deal with whichever problem we have, then we can build, again, the reserves and the coping mechanisms to, to deal with that. that it, that's my favorite quote, by the way, that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And that's what we have to convince people, just like you said, to, to see it as such, that there is a solution, maybe not immediately, but not to give up. You know? Do what you have to do. Uh, to make it worth it and yeah, the rest do what, do it. So that's it in a nutshell. Do, it. do what you have to do to make it worth it. cat. <laughs> so, yes? I, I hate to throw a question just at, at the end, but is there anything in your writing or in the literature that talks about how social media has impacted? Oh, I'm like really glad you got to that. Because, like those of us who are trying to help students or work with students realize it is so vastly different in the yeah. last even 10 years where your self-esteem and your sense of belonging can literally be measured, your know, likes or following, uh, and the sense of it's being able to experiment and be forgiven, well, that doesn't exist anymore. You make a mistake, it gets posted, the internet never forgets. And so the idea of just being constantly monitored, or just, that's my read of it, but what does the literature suggest about the impact of social media on this particular topic? Okay, so there's a, at this point, a growing body of literature that suggests that Gen Z is stressed out and the generation after even more so by social media. Um, in a way because it invades every aspect of one's life. It distorts one's sense of one's place in the world, often to the sense of feeling insignificant or unable to meet. Like you see too many, everyone else is doing all these great things and I'm just stuck here in a room. So, but, Social media also can help people solve the problems they have. Meaning that if you go to websites like the ones I described, rather than just sort of spend time in places that are giving you a message of you're nothing, then your chances are that you will find social support and connection. So for example, I think that this is true especially for people with LGBTQ or my patients who have Asperger's. The social world through media, social media has enabled them to make friends which they never would have had before. So it's a, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, we do think that spending too much time, and it's not just the amount of time, but it's where you go and how you emerge from that experience. Do you feel empowered, enlivened, joyful, you know, excited about the world? Or do you feel drained, pessimistic, you know, 
filled with angst. So what I think we need to do with young people is help them monitor how, they, not how much, they, just partly how much social media time they're spending, but also how are they deciding where they go and how are they evaluating the impact of those experiences on their sense of who they are. And unfortunately, we're kind of late to the game to putting some controls on the companies whose platforms tend to be designed to suck you in and keep you there. Now, I spend a fair amount of time in the second book, uh, which is, you know, you're not done yet. Actually, about a couple of cases of young people with problematic internet use, or PIU, problematic. And that's a whole other discussion. We could have another gathering about that. But to answer your question, um, I don't think social media is in and of itself alone, but I think it plays a role. And certainly, um, you know, the, I'll, I'll, I will allow another discussion about how suicide is portrayed. You have an expert here, uh, but there is a certain glamorization, and it's scandalous to me that some of these um, videos just <coughs> permeate. And then they, they do get people who are on the edge um, to learn how to do it in a way that no one will detect, things like that. That worries me, but it's not new to social media. It's just more, more rapid. So I guess I'm sort of saying, yes, I'm worried. I do think that the ways that people compare themselves to others tends to make them feel if they spend too much time with the negative comparison, I'm not as good as. Um, I, would, I would suggest that I do. I talk a lot with my patients about that. How much do you use? How, what does its impact? Do you feel you have sort of a good experience or not? Um, and what's it preventing you from doing, like sitting and hanging out with people versus being alone? But how would we have fared in the in a pandemic without them? You know what I'm saying? We we have to learn to live with these tools without them destroying us. I hope that makes sense to you. Yeah, um, absolutely. I agree with what you said, Dr. Rustin. The the literature on media, so-called so media effects, it's sort of uh, split. There, of course, there's way more research on media effects pre-internet since it's a fairly right, recent uh, acquisition in the scheme of the, our life on the planet. But So there are things that are specific to social media um, that need to be evaluated and studied as such, as specific to social media, but we can also learn from the rest of the pre-existing and long literature on media effects. We can learn and adapt results and conclusions that are strong and solid from those studies and apply them with whatever tweaking we need to do to social media. What is long-standing in the, history, in the literature on social media, on media effects is what you guys were referring to, the negative effects that media can have on individuals, which goes by the name of virtue effect. And it's important, it exists, it is dangerous. In other words, some individuals, not everybody, but individuals that are already vulnerable for whatever social, individual, psychological reasons, that are already vulnerable as susceptible, may be pushed, as it were, over the edge by certain media portrayal or certain media use that, again, right, isolates them, scapegoats them, etc. What has, though, been um, understudied and underreported is the positive effect of social media, not in positive as in, in pushing people to, again, negative behavior, but uplifting, life-affirming ways in which media and social media in particular can create. The, um, scholar that sort of formalized this this uh, this aspect goes by the name of Thomas Niederkrotenthaler that works in Austria and he came up with the name to encapsulate this life affirming effect of, of media which is the Papagino effect from the Mozart uh, you know um, 
opera, etc. Then somebody that was, you know, helped by by sort of by media, and so there is, for instance, a rapper by the name of Logic. Anybody familiar with him? He wrote a song one, which, with literally the pre-existing uh, suicide prevention number, not the 988, but the 1800, etc. That video, and it gives me goosebumps as I say it, had, and not only has it been viewed by a bajillion people, but the spike in calls to help went through the roof. That is a concrete sort of from the young people example of how media, in this case social media, YouTube, etc., can have a positive impact on other people. This kid literally says in his in his song, I don't want to live. And by the end of it, he calls and he wants to live. It's actually a story of the LGBTQIA plus community, somebody that gets basically rejected by his father for, for being gay. And she says, that's it. But no. So again, this rapper by the name of Logic doesn't shove aside the darkness right, uh, and the pain, but says, OK, I can also do something. And so here's the number, which now is 988, right, unified across the US to seek out for help. And so that song, like I said, uh, um, uh, had promoted and triggered a spike in calls to the, to the helpline. And so it is indeed a mixed bag, meaning with media like with anything else. The bottom line, the way I see it, and again I wrote about it in my book about youth and suicide in media, is that let, let, let's work with kids, let talk, let's talk to kids and say, hey, what do you think of this song? What do you think of this show? Does it make you feel good? Does it make you feel bad? Because again, one thing, 13 reasons why, with, with all the faults that I indeed put black on white on paper in my book and I published, one thing Hannah Baker, the protagonist, does nail correctly, he says, they tell us what to do every single day, when to sit, when to go to the bathroom, when, meaning we are super micromanaged, she was complaining as a young person. So what we haven't done is give you guys, young people, I see many of you here, um, the, the granting you the, the fact that you are capable, you can, let's think together what is good in media and what is bad. And so we can decide, we can think about it as a way of avoiding, right, being swayed by destructive messages like basically 13 reasons why it glamorizes suicide, basically, right? And, and so basically, and complicatedly so, but so then what, what could she have done, right, the Hannah Baker character, instead of storming off the counselor's office, by the way, horrible portrayal of, of counselors, right, that they're not worth, again, seeking out, what if we think, okay, she, he wasn't helpful to her, okay, can she find somebody else, a spiritual figure, another adult, ask another kid, what can I do, I'm in dire straits, give me, you know, give me other options, like, again, the video was saying, try something else. Don't give up. Again, it's not necessarily easy or fun, but right, suicide, um, at least I think, should not be the answer. We should not get there, right? Again, we should work earlier to so that people don't get there. So, um, can I just, oh, of course. One last thought. I just very eloquently put, I really appreciate all of your comments. You raised another issue which has to do with the sense of shaming and bullying, cyberbullying. And we know that those are real facts. And of course, as AI evolves, and now we've got examples of even in schools where young people are taking photographs of their classmates. And it is toxic masculinity because it tends to be young men taking pictures of young women and then 
posting them as nude because they have an AI program that can essentially take off their clothes, strip them off their clothes, or pose them in all other kinds of places. I think the society has to respond. I think mm -hmm. young people have to call out their peers. I think parents have to band together and demand that the companies not let this stuff just happen right. under the guise of censorship, oh, we don't want to censor things. There have to be, and even the Surgeon General of the United States posed an entire monograph with the effects of social media on youth mental health. So there's, if you want to read about it, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, Vivek Murthy, the Surgeon General, just published a beautiful monograph last year. And in it, he points out exactly what you said. There's potential for good, there's a lot of potential for bad. We need to hold the companies accountable to put in safeguards, just like we ask cars to be made with seat belts. Okay? We want to have seat belts for the people who jump in the social media ride they're on and have them not get thrown out into the into the void. And that's something that you know, because otherwise it it blame the they blame the person. Oh, you shouldn't have been looking at that. Well, it's not so easy to stop looking at things once you are drawn in, like in a carnival. You know, it's like, ah, oh, look at all those goodies. So yeah, I just want to say I, I couldn't agree with you more. So. Great. Did you want to make some closing? So, so Xander's going to say something. Okay, yeah, go ahead, Sam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sane and Dr. Siji, for your meaningful conversation. I think we did touch upon very important issues that impact our community directly. Thank you, Ben, again, for coming to Villanova, Dr. Sane. On behalf of the whole Villanova community, I'd like to offer you this gift, which I left at my seat. Back with you to Cooper University as a small token of appreciation for your work and talk today. Thank you again for coming. Thank you for moderating the discussion, Dr. Siji. And thank you all for coming uh, to this discussion on a very important topic.